It's a great pleasure to introduce Gabriella Karin. Although I've never had the pleasure of meeting her in person, because we all know Zoom is not real, but looking at her art and following her innovative work with the LA Holocaust Museum and LA schools, I'm stunned with her lack of self-pity and her innovations in how to tell not just her personal story, but also the wider story of Slovakian Jews. Ms. Karin was just a child when her family began to devise strategies to stay alive in 1942, 43, and 44. She was first sent to a convent, then she went into hiding with her family. She narrowly escaped deportation to the Gestapo headquarters, which was literally across the street uh, from their hideout. When Bratislava was liberated, she remained with her family, studied fashion, which is so obvious in everything she does, married in 1948, and raised her son with her husband in Israel uh, before arriving in LA in 1960. There's two dimensions of her life in recent years which just pop out. First, after her fashion career ended, she moved on uh, and channeled all that talent into creating metal sculptures, which you will be able to see in the PowerPoint and on her website. Second, she uses her art uh, in underserved LA schools where she not only educates students about the Holocaust and history, but inspires them with her wisdom and also helps them create their own art, which can transcend and incorporate a specific past of suffering and help students connect the dots between Jewish suffering and other varieties of hatred and discrimination. All of you listening today know how urgent that task remains. Gabriella, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I was just a young girl when the World War II started. Before the war, we lived in a peaceful, democratic country, very similar than we are living here today. In our wildest dreams, we could not have imagined what will happen, but it did. My parents owned a small deli store that was located next to the police station. And because of the location, they knew every policeman. When the deportation started, it was in 1942. It was done by Slovaks, not by Germans, German orders, but Slovak did all the dirty work. I was put with false papers in a convent. I was very unhappy, in spite the nuns were very nice to me. But I was worried about my parents, about my grandmother, who lived with us all my life. She was always with me. And it was very hard on me. I cried myself to sleep every night. And about a year later, my mother came. And when she saw my cried out eyes, my skinny face, she decided for night, she will come and take me. And in morning, I will try to come to school. And this is what I did next two years. My mother joined the resistance. She received from one of the contacts from the police department, a list of the people who will be taken away a certain night. And she took me with her many, many times. We went to caution people that tonight, for sure, at this address, they will come and take you away. She gave the list to a gentleman, Jonas Epstein. He distributed between his people hundreds and hundreds of people were saved who could do something. Unfortunately, not everybody could. And I will never forget until I leave. 
a scene in front of my eyes. Then we went to my mother, cousin. She was on the list. So was her husband, her old mother, and the four-year-old little boy, my second cousin, was on the list too. And we told them, do something, go somewhere, hide somewhere. This is the address where they will come to pick you up. They started to cry and they told us, we have nowhere to go. We went from one place to another already. We will work and hopefully we will survive. We never saw them again. Next day, my mother went to the railroad station where all the Jewish people were gathered and put on the tracks, on the, on the railroad. She knew the commander, a good friend of my parents, a former neighbor. And she went to him and begged him to give the little boy to her. And he looked down at her and he said, if you don't disappear this minute, I will put you in the wagons too. So she left. What could she do? I will show you what, what happened. You know, six million Jewish people were murdered. I'm showing leaves because a fully falling leaf from a tree is not alive anymore. And I have screaming faces of Jewish people. But not only Jewish people were killed. There were also five million non-Jewish people, like handicapped, courageous resistors, Christians who were politically against the Hitler regime, Jehovah Witnesses, Gypsies, and homosexuals. Five million. Eleven million people were killed. The biggest killing from 1941 to 45. Four years. If you look at the statistic, four years daily. 7,500 people were killed. That means, you know, 25% children. That's a terrible numbers. This is me, a very happy child. Here I'm about six year old, always smiling, laughing, here I am, about 11. Nobody could make me smile. Hard times of the Holocaust. This is my parents' stall. My father in the middle. My mom with me. This is my 10-year-old birthday party. I'm on the far right. These are my friends. I'm the only one who survived. I lost every friend I had. This is my mom. And this gentleman is the man who was the contact to my mother. I remembered his face. I remembered his name. Last year, accidentally, I found his daughter and she gave me the picture. Wow, I couldn't believe that's him. I had his face in my head. Last year, I went to, I went many times back to Slovakia. I was speaking there in their Holocaust Museum. But last year, I was taken by USC Shaw Foundation 
Actually, I was on the March of the Living, but the yearly march from Auschwitz to the other part of Auschwitz where the gas chambers are, about 10 to 7,000 children, students, all high school seniors are marching from the gate of the Auschwitz to the, where the crematoriums were. So we are one week in Poland, going from one camp to other. About 220 young people in the March of the Living. And we go from Poland to Israel, where we can breathe again. I, unfortunately, this year, we couldn't go, you know, why? about the pandemic. What happened? 220 young people couldn't march. But in our thoughts, we were all there. So in Israel last year, USC picked me up, took me to Bratislava, Slovakia, where I was born. We went to the convent. They were waiting for us. The archivist brought out hundred and hundred million of pictures trying I should find myself. I did not, but I did find my teacher. I said, oh, this is Angelica. And the archivist had no idea. Looked through the papers, said, yeah, you are right. That's Sister Angelica. So I was so happy I got her picture. I remembered her very well. And my sculpture, as you see, I'm a sculptor. I express my feelings in clay. This is about the nuns hiding three Jewish girls. It's me and two sisters. I will tell a little bit later more about it. But now I'm telling you, after three years in the convent, we had to go in a complete hiding. And just tell you a few numbers. Slovakia had 90,000 Jewish people. In 1942, 60,000 people, Jewish people, were taken to the camps. 230 people returned. Statistically means from 1,000 people, four people survived. I was hidden with my family by this gentleman, Karol Blanar, who had it in his heart to risk his own life to hide eight people. It was my mother, my father, and I was the only child to my parents, my aunt, two uncles, and two friends of my parents. This certificate of honor is done to honor Karl Blanar by Yad Vashem as a righteous person among the nations. Karl Blanar and his parents are mentioned because they were hiding my grandmother. A righteous family. Karl Blanar after liberation, brought a couple of articles against communism. He was a lawyer. When communists took over, he had to flee the country. 
he got a word that he made it over the border. But then we lost track. And I was looking for him everywhere. I became an adult. I wanted to find him. I wanted to know what happened to him. And I wanted to thank him for the life. But he risked to save me and give me a life to live. I was looking everywhere. I looked through every phone book I could put my hands on. I could not find him. I contacted organizations. Well, I could not contact him at all. About 15 years ago, I got my first computer. So I Googled him. He didn't come up. Then I remember he had a younger brother, Vincent Blanar. I put his name in. Vincent Blanar was a university professor, wrote about 25 books. His name appeared, showing his phone number, showing his address. I hardly could believe my eyes. I went to the phone. I did not look if it's morning, night, whatever. I couldn't care less. And he picked up the phone. And I tried to introduce myself. And he said, I remember you. Oh, good. Just tell me where is Carol. Well, he said, Carol lived in the United States, in Dublin, Ohio. He got married, no children, but he died in 1980. Wow. I missed the opportunity to thank him personally. To honor his deed, to give me a life to live. I asked him where he's buried. The only thing I can do for him to visit his grave. And I Ask him and he could not tell me because he didn't know this time the communist occupied countries and the free world, they could not communicate. So he had no idea. I called up every cemetery around, around Dublin, Ohio. And I did not find him. One day, talking in Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, a gentleman approached me and said, I'm very good finding people like that. Just give me some details. I went home. I sent him everything I know. He found him the next day in Columbus, Ohio, in an unmarked grave. A person who risked his life for eight people did not have his name on his grave. He also got this certificate of honor as a righteous person among the nations. It bothered me so much. I called the cemetery and I asked them, please look it up. Tell me what happened. 35 years later, Looking through their books, they told me nobody was there. Only the priest, when they buried him. Nobody paid. That's it. I said, no, that's not it. I'm ordering a marker right now. And I want to have written on it, righteous person among the nations. And when they were putting the marker in the earth, I went there with my grandson, Dad Kern. He had a video camera. And if you want to hear my goodbye speech, 
I have a website, gabrielakerin.com, and you can listen to it. I have also other sculptures there. You can take a look. These are the two houses I want to show you. To the right, this is the house where we were hidden. And the Germans, when they occupied Slovakia, they went from house to house, from apartment to apartment. The only house they did not enter was the house where we were hidden, the house on the right. This house was built in 1935 in the democratic Czechoslovakia and in the bylaws of the house was written, no Jew can live in this house. So they never entered this house. And it was across the street of Slovak Gestapo, Linkova Garda. When I was there recently, I was asking, what's there now? Said somebody from abroad bought it, doesn't allow anything in it. It stands empty. This sculpture is about my hiding. You see the German boots marching in front of the house. I saw them. They didn't see me. In the middle there, I'm sitting and reading. Can you imagine yourself for nine months, a whole school year, sitting in a chair, not be able to walk around, and not be able to speak. And what I was doing all the day, 14 hours a day, I was sitting and reading. And Carol Blanar brought me books and he could not bring me books for a young girl. I was 13 at this time. He brought me history books, heavy books to read, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and I was reading whatever I got into my hands. And in a way, it gave me a hope because I was reading about the wars that were happening in the world and each one finished. So I figured in my mind, this will finish one day too. Carol Blanar bringing us food there. I'm showing this. And to the right are the people. It was my mother and my father. And I was the only child to my parents, my aunt, two uncles, and two friends of my parents. This sculpture is in Slovakia in one of their museums. Our last possessions. First, they took away our citizenship, and then they took away our jobs, and then our apartments. And when they took people to the camps, they allowed them to take a small luggage. When they arrived in the camp, step down from the train, the first thing that they took away was the last thing from home, the small luggage. Twelve windows to the unforgettable past. The first window shows the Shevastika coming, but the world was silent. Kristina. The Night of Broken Glass, November 9, 1938. All over Germany, Austria, they were burning Jewish synagogues. Hundreds of them burned to ground 
thousand put on fire. And they started to take Jewish men to camp. It was nine months before the World War II started. And there was a window of opportunity to let children out, children from age two to age 17. The world did not open their gates to let them in. The only place was England. They saved 10,000 children. And I was going from museum to museum and there was not a word about it and it bothered me and I decided to do something. So I made this sculpture. It's 15 feet long. You see on the end, that's a cattle car with the parents going the other way. I have about 600 faces of children. When I started working and emailing to people to try to get pictures, I was so overwhelmed. A friend of mine today, I hardly knew her at this time, came to me and she said, can I help you? I looked at her and said, yes. <laughs> said, what do you need? I said, a lot of emailing. I'm so overwhelmed. I cannot even work with my sculptures. So she took over this part, found over 600 people. She had all their stories. We were looking at the material when I finished about a year later. And we said, we should put it in a book. She said, I can write. So she became the author. I became the illustrator. Today, Michel Gold is the chairperson in Los Angeles Museum of Holocaust. I'm very proud of her. Actually, here on the first picture is her mom. She was on the kinder transport. And we put it in a book. It's an educational book about this part of the Holocaust. On the right, you can see Michelle. She's the author. I'm the illustrator. There I am on the left. Bunk beds. Can you imagine a twin size bed? Four to five people sleeping in it. Then one turned, everybody had to turn around. Starving prisoner. Death march. When the camps were almost liberated, when the people in the camp heard the shooting of the Allies, and they thought, in a day or two, we will be free. The Germans opened the gates and marched people hundred and hundred miles to another camp. It was middle of January, freezing cold European winter. People didn't have proper shoes or proper clothes. No food, no water. More than half of the people died in the death march, just a few months before liberation. Forced labor, hard physical work, silent scream. A child is leaving mother hand, cannot reach it. Gate of Auschwitz, written on it, Arbeit macht frei. The work makes you free. What the irony behind these gates. The hand, this is my best friend hand. 
det södra berömmet. Railroad, going to the gas chambers. The Germans took away from us everything, also the wedding rings. And as precise they are, they created and cataloged everything. And this last one, it's a mountain of Jewish stars mountain of dead people and from all this horror came out state of israel and i had the a cactus you know why a cactus everybody who is born in israel is called sabra and sabra is a fruit of the cactus prickly outside sweet inside It's after liberation. The train started to come home with survivors. We went every day to the railroad station, looking for a familiar face, not be able to recognize people. People looked like skeletons. And I was standing there, a young person. And I was thinking in myself, how can I live a normal life? A normal life. After what I went through, what I see here today, and I was deciding in myself, Hitler did not get my body and he will not get my soul. I will smile and I will be happy. I was 14 years old at this time. And this is my family. I'm using a falling leaf from a tree because a leaf that is falling down from a tree is not alive anymore. And I wrote names of my family members, 75 of them who were killed in the Holocaust. The little boy I was telling you about is there too. And this sculpture is 11 feet tall. The whole thing is rotating. The leaves are falling, light is coming through. Call it shimmering leaves, perished families. I saw this sculpture, the University of Laverne. It's there in their interface building, in the entrance of the building. This is something new I made and it's about kind of today. This is the past, the Holocaust. This is the present, stop the hate. And this is the future, children holding hands around the globe, hoping, dancing, smiling. This is the future. And this is what's happening now, the global pandemic. So I made a globe and the globe is wearing a mask because right now we are all equal. We are all in it, the whole world. Hopefully, I'm hoping a lot, 
and I see what's happening today. And I see around me neighbors being so kind to each other. And I think the world will change after we will be through with this pandemic, we will have a kinder, better world. Albert Einstein's words, the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. And I want to read to you a few words that I brought about the situation that's going on today. I want to express my revulsion at the brutal mur murder of George Floyd. I hope that the current movement can achieve justice and we should all work to fix the systemic flaws in this country. Even though you are not protesting, this is something that you have to work on inside yourself each and every day. We must all be a part of the movement. This is the only way we will achieve change. When you are my age and your grandchildren will ask you about what you did during this time, what will you tell them? Will you tell them you stood up against the racism that has led to so many black lives being lost during the Holocaust? I saw firsthand what it means to be targeted by the state. The Jewish people were treated as having no value I see so many parallels from the Holocaust to the way that black people are discriminated against in America. The Nazis murdered my family and friends and millions of other Jews similar to how, how George Floyd, Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and so many black Americans were murdered in the hands of racist police and white supermarxists. Let us work together to build a more equal, compassionate and just society because it does not matter what color skin you have, what color eyes you have, what color hair you have. We are all the same people and we don't have to love everybody, but we have to respect every person in this world. Thank you for listening. Uh, we will now take questions and uh, I already received a few, but I would like to encourage uh, the audience to submit more. So first, meanwhile, I'll ask the first question, uh, Gabriella. Um, one anonymous attendee wrote, you use symbolism in your work. Can you describe some of the recurring images and what they symbolize to you? And this person also wrote that he or she sees hope and beauty in your necklaces and pins. You see, I'm very good. Butterfly. Yes, the butterfly was actually mentioned. So, uh, can you explain the recurring images and what they symbolize to you? Butterfly, leaves, etc. Okay, the butterfly from this ugly cocoon comes a beautiful butterfly. It's a transformation for all of us from the bad parts in our lives can come something beautiful out. It's a hope for our future, for every person. Whatever hardship you have, it will change like the butterfly. Leaves are falling from a tree, so they are not alive. 
some musings and for the people who were killed in Holocaust. Something else she asked? Okay, uh, another question by David L. Do you think these unspeakable atrocities can ever be forgiven? And uh, David, I gather, is talking about the Holocaust. So do you think they can be forgiven or even compared to any other tragedies? This was one of the worst tragedy of mankind. I don't think it can be compared to anything else. They were the smaller things that happened in the world, but this was a absolutely unbelievable 11 million people's murder. State support murder. Another question from uh, Susanna. Uh, what helps you, and I just glanced at it, I couldn't write everything down. What helps you maintain your incredibly positive outlook and have your lovely smile? Uh, Susanna wrote that it's very contagious. You smile. You won't feel bad too long. It helps. Try it. <laughs> it works. It works for me. It works for other people. But what helps you maintain this attitude that you should try to smile? I believe in people. I'm hoping also from this pandemic, we may come out as better people. We will be kinder to each other. I see changes today. Neighbors whom I never even knew call up or knock on my door. If I need something. I see it all over. We have this neighborhood watch. I see the letters. People start to care about each other. It will change, you will see. We will have kinder people coming out of it. I strongly believe in it. And add to it my smile. <laughs> Um, that also, what you just said, Gabriela, um, addresses uh, what somebody else was saying. What gives you hope today? I think you were just stating that uh, just all of us being in this, affected by this pandemic, this difficult time, which for some has been horrendously difficult. I jokingly say I got training. I was <laughs> nine months uh, hidden. So it doesn't bother me too much that I have to be. I am still free. Nobody is after me. But whatever is happening, is happening to all of us. Mm -hmm. So I am not the only one who has to be behind closed doors or to wear the mask. So we just have to go through it. And they will, will. The scientists are working. They will come up with something. I'm, I'm pretty sure about it. Do you think the recent racist, um, well, atrocities, I guess we can call that too, the murder of George Floyd and all that, that this also, these events will lead to something more positive? I'm hoping that people will understand that we are all the same people. It doesn't matter what color skin we have. Yeah, this, this they should understand, everybody. Let's be kinder to each other. Everybody has the right to be here. One day, 
will wake up to a better world where people will be more understanding to each other. Uh, several um, of our attendees actually appreciated your comments at the end. And uh, Brianna, for instance, um, thanked you and appreciated very much that you addressed Black Lives Matter. So she wanted to take the time to let you know. Uh, I have another question from Judy. Um, what made your family decide to leave Israel and to move to the United States? My mother in 39, 38, when it started, she wanted to leave. We couldn't. We didn't have enough money to buy tickets. We didn't have uh, where to go. We didn't have family in the United States. We couldn't get a visa. So we got stuck there. In 48, I got married and I got married very early. I was 17 and um, I had a great marriage. I was married 64 years. We, as newlyweds, we went to Israel. Also, every gate was closed but Israel was open for everybody. We went with the Haganah transport. Golda Meir, who later became the Prime Minister of Israel, came back to America, gathered men, money. She was supposed to get $25 million this time. She gave a speech she got $50 million, bought four planes for Israel. These were the only planes Israel had to fight in the independence war and established transports in Czechoslovakia to leave, to get training for young people to come and fight for Israel. We left with the second transport, my husband and me, we arrived to Israel, was ceasefire. They did not need us to go fight. Suddenly, we were standing there in Haifa Arbor on our luggages. We were free. We could go what we want. We thought we go to army and they will take care of us. Suddenly, we didn't know what to do. A young man came to us and said, I'm from a kibbutz. Come with me. We will take care of you. We will give you work, food, lodging. Everything will be taken care of. My husband turns to me and said, I like it. He looked at me. I'm a, I'm a city girl. <laughs> I'm a fashion designer. What will I do in a kibbutz? <laughs> so we didn't go. That was the end of my kibbutz life. <laughs> and so we went to, the state was taking care of us. Took us in the, not a very good lodging, like 50 people in a room, but we had where to sleep and they gave us food. But very shortly, we found work, both of us, my husband and me, and we, we found our own lives. It was there 10 years. My parents came with the force, Haganah transport, because they allowed the parents of the people who were there to come. My mother still wanted to go to the United States. Finally, we had enough money. She took a vacation. She came to New York. She looked around. She had friends. She talked to everybody. Came back and started to work on us. Let's go to America. I always wanted to live there. Da, 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 da. 
take her two years talking, talking. <laughs> and we uh, came together with my parents. My son was born in Israel. He was two when we came. He's not a little boy anymore. And so this is how we came. The United States, we came straight to Los Angeles. We came on a work permit. My friends were here already. They, get, they got us papers that we got jobs here. But we, didn't, we never used it. We found our old jobs, but that's good. Okay, I have another um, very good question from April, um, who hopes to be a future counselor. Um, how did you translate your pain and trauma into art? And how has art helped you process your grief? I think that's a, a very um, interesting question. I never thought I will do something about Holocaust. Never occurred to my mind. There was a trial in London. David Irving, who was denying Holocaust, and he was on trial. And it upset me a lot that somebody can deny facts. And um, I decided there are so much, there is so much written word. I will do something visual. Maybe it, people will understand it better. And this is when I started to make sculptures about Holocaust. I made my first one. It's in the Museum of Tolerance in the library. So everybody can see it if they want to. And um, I thought I will never do any other one. It was so hard to me on me. And then I thought, well, I should make something. What happened to me? So I made it. And then I made another one. And slowly, slowly, I have a whole bunch of it. Can you tell us uh, about the day you were free to emerge from hiding? What do you remember uh, about that day when you oh, finally were able to? My second birthday. <laughs> second <laughs> birthday. <laughs> so what happened was we were always thinking, oh, on my birthday, on my mother's birthday. We never talked about my father's birthday because it was so far. We, we are, my mother and me were on the end of the year. So we were hoping we will be free. Nothing. Birthday passed, nothing. We were freed on the evening of my father's birthday. We always, in my family, celebrate the birthday evening before, because like Shabbat starts day before, after the sun goes down, and the first star comes out. This is when the day, next day starts, and this is when we got free on my father's first 40th birthday. The biggest gift he could ever get. Freedom. That must have been quite a wonderful day. <laughs> yes. Um, one more question from David. Um, I think that's another intriguing one. How do you explain the remarkable resilience that survivors have demonstrated? Many survivors, like yourself. Do you have an explanation for that? For today? Um, no, just in the post-Holocaust uh, world. So many survivors were able to, um, to go on and first build a new life and then um, go on to do remarkable things and become uh, models of their community, models of uh, inspiration and moral leaders. How, how do you explain that? 
I know that we never talked about it. We did not want to live with the memory of it. All of us. I can talk to everybody. We just started to talk maybe 20 years ago. Then we probably, at least me, I was feeling, should, we should talk. People should know. Otherwise, they will forget what happened. And um, it will be just like any other history, almost not real to people. And uh, this is when we started to talk. I had friends in Israel, good friends, for a lifetime, like 20 of us. Most of them were survivors. 90%. I don't know their stories. Actually, last time I was in Israel, I went to meet one of them, and I said, before we say a word, I want to hear your story. I never heard it. So he told me. Unbelievable what he did. So you see? So do you think that gave you, um, you and survivors like you who have been sharing the story, do you think that kind of gave you a, no, a, a moral mission? We, we just didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. My husband, until his last day, had a very hard time to talk about it. I know his story. I wrote it up. Actually, it will be printed these days. And I am, first thing what I did, when this pandemic started, and we got cooked up in our houses, I was sitting by my computer, and I wrote my memoirs. I am done. I'm finished. Congratulations! Working like crazy. That's a great way to spend your time <laughs> while being uh, quarantined. Uh, Gabriella, I would like to uh, let you know that there were quite a few messages from people uh, sending you their best wishes, love and blessings, and uh, really expressing their warm appreciation for what you're doing and how impressed they were. I don't have the names here, but I wanted to make sure that you are aware of that. Um, I think we are at the end of uh, the presentation. I would like to thank all of you who uh, took the time to join us today. Uh, this was definitely a time well spent. Uh, thank you especially, Gabriella, for being a source of inspiration and encouragement to all of us. I'm quite confident that I speak on behalf of many who had uh, the privilege to hear you today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all. And we'll be back with uh, brand new programming in the fall, the Holocaust Workshop. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>